Good morning, everybody. I'm Garth Payne. Nice to meet you all. Um, and um, I'm going to give you a talk uh, this morning for about half an hour or so. And that's going to be followed by a performance of a piece that I'm making um, this year at EARCAM and ZKM called Future Perfect, um, which is for high order ambisonics and a new system that we're building that will then use all of your cell phones as the point source is within the sound field. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Obviously, the performance of the first part of the work, the work is not finished yet, but the first 23 minutes I'll share with you today. Um, we'll demonstrate a bunch of those techniques on your phones, using your phones as a, as, as a sound field within the ambisonics. Um, and then we'll have 15 or 20 minutes for, you know, further questions and any other things that you want to ask me about that. Um, as you've probably already been listening and thinking about high-order ambisonics, um, it's a really fantastic way of building an environment, right, of building this kind of immersive sound field that you're within. <clears throat> And I really love that. And it generates this sense for me of, of a kind of ecosystem of an environment that you're sitting within. Um, the cell phone work that we've been doing this year was actually inspired by being here at the workshop last year and working with the Wavefield system here and really thinking about the power of being able to bring the audio inside that field and move it through the audience and to generate um, kind of psychoacoustic phenomena within the, the space right next to you, an intimate quality of sound that came to you rather than you listening to this beautiful, you know, environment that's out there in the, in the ambisonics. So what I want to do today is to show you a little bit of past work um, that contextualises why I'm making the piece that I'm making this year, um, tell you a little bit about that piece, um, show you a little bit of the background tech. Um, I won't go into that too heavily in the talk, um, and then move on to the performance. Yes. Okay, so what you're seeing here is a piece that I made in 1998 um, for the next Wave Festival in Australia called Map One. Um, and this piece is essentially a, a, a granular synthesis engine, and it's being driven by a single camera up here in the roof tracking my movement here. And there are a bunch of um, essentially sliders on the floor and some other analysis going on um, that allows the sound that's made in the space to become a kind of fluid, creative material that's being driven by the people in the space. <clears throat> and so this piece was the first piece that I made that had no content. And it really made me start to think about how do I make an installation work that is essentially a framework to be performed by audience members that actually is a composed structure but has no audio in it, right? And, and opens up the possibility for the audience to be actively involved in its creation. Around the same time, I was also making a bunch of um, interactive dance works, 
And, um, and I'm just going to show you two of those because these also were good platforms for me to really think about what interaction means and how we build and design that. Um, and so I'm going to show you just two examples of that. This is a piece that we made in 2001 with Company in Space in Australia. It's a telepresence piece between Australia and Hong Kong. Um, you'll see the Australian dancer in the front, the dancers in the Hong Kong in the rear. And as I was writing algorithms to generate the music for this in real time, I was really thinking about, well, how do I make a dance work that's an hour long, that's interactive, that has form, structure, et cetera, et cetera, and is really driven by the choreography. And so what you'll see in here are some higher level analysis um, processes and easy ones to see will be, for instance, when the head of the dancer in Hong Kong aligns with the head of the dancer in Australia, um, states of synthesis change and so on. So I'll just play you a little bit of this um, as an example of that. <coughs> and you'll hear here this pattern of synthesis changes as she repeats this pattern. So rather than looking for triggers, it's really looking for building inertia within repeated patterns, building energy. Again, repeated patterns, continued alignment, slowly building new patterns in the synthesis algorithm. So that was, <clears throat> again, thinking about how is this a kind of ecosystem whereby all of these things remain alive? Because it's really easy to write the sound and then people dance to it. Well, it's easy for those of us who are composing a lot. Um, but it's really hard to make a system that has complexity but is actually constantly a living thing, right? It's dynamic all the time. Um, here's uh, the final example I'll show you of this, which is a piece that I made with Helen Skye in Australia called Dark Ridge of Night. In this case, she's wearing uh, brainwave sensing, um, muscle sensing on the arms, um, accelerometer and gyroscope on the shoulder and the hand. And all of the image content and all of the sound content is generated from her for the entirety of the performance. Um, and so you'll see, again, patterns of repeated behaviour, tension in the arm. You'll see this pattern like this that she's doing that slowly dissolves and breaks up the whole space. <clears throat> and this is her voice as source. So these works really started thinking about an ecosystem of performance, an ecosystem of sounding activity, the, the idea that everything is, is energy and the performance should be a kind of large dimensional light, living thing. More recently I built a set of um, singing bowl robots, Tibetan singing bowl robots, 
and these sit in the gallery um, and play for sometimes for months on end. And so again for this I thought, well how do I control these? And so I built an environment with little agents that move around using Brownian motion and as they enter the space where the robot is, it causes the robot to either strike or to ring up. And so you get this constantly evolving texture, this material of sound in the gallery that's constantly changing and, and, and it's not written by me, it's an evolving process essentially. So that's a little bit of background. And then more recently, um, I'm at um, Arizona State University. I established the Listen Project and the Acoustic Ecology Lab there, which has really started looking at sound in the environment as a key indicator of, of climate impact in those environments. And, and, and so having long-term recordings and monitoring of those environments, but also as a way of building community in those environments and building awareness of what's going on in the natural environment at this time. So here's a very quick one minute talk from me on the power of listening. <laughs> Sound is part of our memory. It has a physicality that allows us to be utterly present or transported to a special place. It's also why I'm drawn to nature like Joshua Tree National Park, dry desert, never silent, but subtle, fragile, sparse. Movement of wind, the song of cactus spikes, the dry wings of a dragonfly. Last spring, heavy rain filled the dam there, teeming with light, frogs, ducks, canyon wrens, owls and bats. You could hear a remarkable ecological transformation. Listening is a powerful experience. We sense the size of place, the density of the air, the surrounding events. It's also a trainable skill. Pick a sound and focus on every tiny little detail. Or shift your attention listening to the interactions. This is the acoustic ecology. Usually we don't think about how we listen, but when we do, the world becomes remarkably richer. And so the work that we've been doing in the Listen Project at its simplest is actually going and visiting communities across the southwest of US and running listening workshops. So teaching people basically active, passive and directed listening skills. And people generally report to us that that transforms the way they engage with the environment because they essentially have been doing that all the time, but now they have a word to name it as a skill that they can practice and suddenly they're conscious of listening and they can kind of decide to listen in different ways and suddenly start to understand the power of it. So this project um, builds, you know, this idea of placemaking, building communities, um, and, and teaching these modes of listening. And it's also commissioned a bunch of works written using only the sounds that are in our ongoing database. And so the other key part of this project is that we've been building communities of field recordists. And so what we've been doing also in these communities is training people um, to make field recordings, and then we give them small ambisonic uh, recorders and then they record at the same location every month for us. And we've been doing that now for some five years. Um, so the project's broken up around these areas of exploration, experience and engagement. And as you can see here, working with some young people, <coughs> how incredibly <laughs> engaged they are when you give them a pair of headphones and a microphone and they get out there. Um, and so we now have about 20 people who we've armed with these little Brahma Zoom recorders who go and record at the same location every month um, in Joshua Tree National Park, Organ Pipe Cactus National Park, uh, National Monument, um, Kings Canyon Sagoya National Park, and in parts of the Mojave Desert. <clears throat> and then I have a bunch of students who are kind enough to listen to all these recordings and tag them so that we load them up on the website and they become a searchable database. Um, which you can, you can find on the Listen website. Um, then when you do a search there, <coughs> it brings up the recordings and you can just click on the little loudspeaker here and listen to it. So this makes it accessible rather than, I'm sure many of us who make field recordings and never get around to searching them and tagging them and putting them anywhere where we can actually go back and use them. Um, so the experience of making the recording becomes the kind of primary activity. Um, <clears throat> so we're really trying to make these accessible to everybody and by putting them online, 
you can go and listen to them, play them in your office while you're working, whatever you like. Um, I've written a bunch of works from this material and as I said, we've been commissioning works as well and we're running workshops in the public to compose works from the recordings that they make as a kind of creative placemaking activity. Can it be sampled? Can it be sampled? You mean, can you use the sounds? Um, yes, if you write, preferably we ask you to write to us just to ask if you can use them and then, yeah. We, the, a number of people have used them okay. for projects, yes. Um, <clears throat> another part of that project is the Eco Rift project, um, which is a virtual reality project where we're taking those environments to people who can't otherwise get there. And in 2014, I was on the Kickstarter for Oculus and we launched this project called Eco Rift at South by Southwest Eco in 2014, which was kind of a, which was really about taking these national assets, these beautiful environments that we protect as a nation, to people who couldn't get out there. Um, and so we, we've taken those to a bunch of um, environmental and other um, showcases and worked a lot with kids and then here, for instance, you can see taking them into classrooms to talk about the value of biodiversity and the value of these environments. And this is, I personally think, extremely important at this point because if people have an urban life where they never go into these environments, it's hard to understand the value of having them there. I mean, I really appreciate that's hard to understand if you don't go and experience them. So, so bringing those environments to people in this way, I think, helps that discussion kickstart that discussion and enrich it. Um, in addition, because of the experiences we've noticed when we've put people in these environments around the globe, um, we've also started taking them into aged care homes and we're about to start um, projects on uh, recovery rates of post-surgery recovery rates in hospital um, and a big study on wellness and livability metrics in aged care homes. If people are able to be out in nature in virtual reality on a regular basis? Does that improve their overall well-being in aged care homes? Does it improve recovery rates in hospitals? Um, because there's good previous research that shows if you have a window and you can see outside and see nature when you're in hospital, you actually feel better and you recover quicker and you get out of hospital faster, all of which are good things. Okay, so all of that is background to Future Perfect, the piece that I'm making uh, this year because I'm bringing all of those things together in this piece, um, which is why I gave you a little bit of background there. And so Future Perfect um, is uh, my artistic research residency between EACAM and ZKM across this year. And I spent the first half of the year um, working um, at EACAM. Um, and it's going to be a concert experience using smartphones um, to produce both virtual reality environment and spatial audio, and you'll experience some of the spatial audio stuff today. Um, as you can see from my previous work, this next comment makes some sense now, that Future Perfect really explores this kind of seam, the, the kind of porosity that, that exists between virtual experiences, both as a documentation of place and an archiving of nature, and as a creative and expressive space, because there's a lot of work that's either in the gaming domain, which is very virtual, right? Or there's, the, or there's like, hey, go and sit on an island in the Pacific. Um, but thinking about where those two things really meet and how porous that meeting point can be is, is something that I, don't, I haven't seen a lot of work on just yet. I, I've also thought for a little while that it could be that these VR documentations that we're making, for instance, and others, could in the not so distant future be, you know, nature as we know it, right? If, if climate impact is really very serious, then, then these may be records of, of, you know, what used to be there. Um, and also this idea that when you're in a headset, it can, it's a very private experience. So when people put on the nature experiences, they, they feel like they're there and they're there by themselves. Now, in a concert work, part of the value of having a concert, obviously, is that we come together and we have a kind of ritualistic celebration <laughs> of being together. And so this idea that it's not only private but communal is something that I'm working on in this project 
um, which is ways in which we could see each other as representations in the virtual space and drawing vectors between people who are moving in similar directions and so on. It's also an interesting point that in the VR space, and in fact, even using web audio, um, people can create their own point of view. So where you're walking may change your perspective on things. The perspective is not fixed, right? Whereas in a fixed projected media piece, the perspective is the same for everybody. Um, so the idea that we can have the actual space being warped in various directions by where people are and how they move through the space is to me very interesting. Um, so I had the pleasure of being here last year and working with this incredible system. And um, it just inspired and raised many questions in my head. Um, and, and we put the, the wave field and the ambisonics together. I played a bunch of recordings that I made in rainforests in Mexico and then brought birds into the space through the wave field and, and thought about that. And then Lynn Groger and I did an experiment where we put a bunch of sign tones at points in the space. And then we started to hear the beating in the air between those sign tones. And it became really clear that the wave field system was not just a playback system, but it was actually putting energy into the air and exciting the air in a way that a, a normal loudspeaker just doesn't do, right? And so then we started to get all these other psychoacoustic phenomena that are happening in the air as a byproduct of the energy that we're putting into the space. And that, I think, is like really, really interesting. Um, so, so the proposal to EARCAM was to, again, put these, these two systems together um, to, to fill in the space that's generated by the high order ambisonic um, field and to bring sound to people, to make it personal and, and intimate. And so I started that work originally in Unity and built a bunch of things. And then there's been for some time the Cosima project at EARCAM looking um, at um, situated media. And I'll, I'll show you a bit about that. Um, so I also started thinking about, well, could we deploy all of this in the browser on the phone? And if so, what would the benefits and, and the disadvantages of that be? Um, so then I started thinking about the phones as point sources. And obviously, here you have several hundred loudspeakers. Um, when, you know, here we have, I don't know how many of you there are, 65 maybe loudspeakers, right, sitting in the audience right here. Um, and so then if I could think about those as point sources, then I could perhaps track and generate dynamic maps of where you are in the space. So the point sources could move in the space as well in a way that the loudspeaker cannot. Um, we could use that phone then to manage diffusion across the whole set of phones and, and think about then the phones as a kind of texture, fabric, that fills in the space inside the, the ambisonic system. And then the next phase that we've started working on will include using the phones additionally, not only as playback, which you'll hear today, and I'll dynamically be sending sound to your phone and spatializing it and so on, but also to add to that um, the CATART engine, the concatenative synthesis engine, so we could then start doing real-time granulation and real-time resynthesis on the phones as, as well as spatializing that context. So, that, so I find this idea really interesting, which is that we start to treat the entire concert space as, a re, as, a, as an audio field and that the point of view, the lens of the audience, becomes something that's dynamic and can be moved around during the performance. Um, so the problem of tracking phones is still a big problem. <laughs> and, um, and generally, it needs a bunch of infrastructure. And I really wanted to get away from that because I want to tour this show. I want to be able to rock into any old hall and do the show. And so. Um, I started developing based on this Navisense API, which has you know, just come out, startup company, um, which is a system that allows you to track movement without any external infrastructure from the phone. So no Wi-Fi, no um, GPS, nothing. And um, so this is me walking around and around the third floor of EARCAM. Um, for those of you who know that floor, the coffee machine's up here, so walking around the studios. 
walking up there and walking back and so on. And doing this repeatedly and, and walking around Stravinsky Fountain repeatedly until people thought I was completely crazy to see what is the, what is the error that's going on here. Like, can I do this and come back to the same location? And you can see here a little bit of drift, um, but essentially it's not bad. And I decided in the end that plus or minus one metre would probably be the maximum variation that I'm getting here. So I also built this world in Unity so I could actually walk around and have places to walk to because in the final work you'll be in a virtual reality space. And here you can see the XY heading and, and these uncertainty figures that the API gives you, which are very useful because obviously if you get an uncertainty figure on a packet that's really high, you can just throw it away and not worry about it. And you can see these uncertainties are not bad. These are in percentages. Um, so I spend a lot of time also like leaving a tree and going for a walk around and then trying to find my way back to that tree and seeing if that was accurate enough. And so this is um, probably what I'll be implementing in the final work so that when you come into the concert, you'll start your phone. I'll give you a VR header, a headset to put your phone in at the door. And when you walk from that point, it'll track where you are in the space. And that will mean that everybody will be sending a dynamic point of view um, location that we can use to warp both image and auditory perspectives during the performance. How it's done? Um, so it's using the gyroscope and the compass within the phone, um, and and a bunch of AI that, of course, is you know tucked away there that you never get to look at. <laughs> um, and I think that's obviously related to the kind of movement the body makes as you walk. Um, but yeah, I don't know what the what the background. It's 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 a black box in in that sense. Uh, Um, okay, so this this API that I'm using uses no external infrastructure at all. Uh, well, it, so it's not using any it's not using any GPS satellites at all. No, no uh, GPS, no Wi-Fi, no external infrastructure. Uh, because in some cases that's available on the third floor of Earcam. There's down underground. There's no GPS, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so I could set up a bunch. I mean, this is a big discussion we had. At, at Earcam because they're like, we've tried all these solutions and they're not great. Um, yeah, you can, I bought a bunch of beacons, we tried that, it's really inaccurate, you lose them half the time, you know. Um, so no, this, this NaviSense, if you go and look at navisense.com, um, you can turn on for external use, a, a, like a GPS function here as, a, as an in initial reference, but after the initial reference it doesn't use it and, and that's only for mapping uh, projects. But all of the work that I'm doing here doesn't use, ev all the external infrastructure functions are turned off. And that's, that's its real strength. And this is the only API NaviSense that I know that's doing that well at the moment. And that's their business, is to do this really well. Um, just a short question about <coughs> the, the project, the yep. performance. When the public comes in, yes. you, you're going to use their phones. Yes. Yeah. And install something on their phones right away. No, they'll just use the browser. Just their browser? Yes. You'll get to do that today if you have a phone awesome. with you. <laughs> yeah, so that's the whole idea. So, um, OK, so this is all building uh, um, off the Cosimo project um, at EARCAM, which was um, established by Norbert Schnell. And um, Frederick's team um, build this, have been building this for some time. So this basically allows us to use w web technology to develop a, a network of phones running connected to a server, which we'll do today. Um, and then we can run a bunch of modules here on the phone to do um, you know, audio playback synthesis and so on. This infrastructure has actually evolved since this point, so it's not quite accurate, but the general idea is accurate. Um, then everything that's running on the phone is, is built in JavaScript, and so it'll just run in a browser um, using uh, HTML5, and I'll talk a little more about that. Um, in addition, we have open sound control built in, so we can automate functions um, in the system. 
Um, and of course, that means we can send to other external um, audio applications. So it's using Node.js. Some of you might know Node, um, which is a, a runtime environment that um, allows you also to bring in a bunch of other functionality really quickly. And, and then written in JavaScript. So this is the controller view, which I'll show you later. This is the client player, um, or some of the code for that. Um, and you can see these are you know, fairly basic functions that allow you to run sound in the browser. Um, then Node under NPN um, is, is, is a streaming um, uh, network control package that, that allows us to run really low latency. And what we actually do is we generate a system clock. So all of your phones are actually clocked to a synchronous clock. So we could play actually a rhythmic pattern across everybody's phones and they would be synchronous. Um, I mean, there's a few milliseconds variation, but essentially synchronous. Um, it also means that I can push sound to your phone um, for spatialization really fast and maintain synchronicity across the entire audience, which is super important. Um, so they're, they're background um, infrastructures that allow us to do that. Um, so this is what I'll run today, actually. Um, and Node allows me to do this, uh, where is it, watch. NPN run watch up there. Um, so this allows me actually to compile what's called transpile the code um, for every performance, which also means that the development environment stays live. We don't have to build it into an app. We don't have to kind of compile anything to a fixed point. And that's super great because it's really like having a max patch you could, or whatever. You can just keep you know, evolving and building that thing. And then you, you push compile for the performance. And there, there we have the next version of that. Um, the key thing, for those of you who don't know, in HTML5 for web audio is this web, this audio context function. Um, so audio context opens up all of the web audio kit that's sitting in the background in your browser and allows you to do loads of stuff. And within a single audio context, you can learn in half an hour to write a basic synth and play it on your phone. It's, it's um, fantastic technology. Um, if you're interested in playing with some of the apps, this, this URL at EarCam will um, take you to some of these that are online and, and available for you to explore and play with. So here's a little example of, of a, a trade show where Norbert was showing off some of this functionality. So the audio is terrible, of course. But anyway, um, some of the better examples uh, um, which I find really interesting are these kind of almost, uh, well, crowdsource performances um, and where you could kind of have flash mob performances almost. In this case, an installation. This is, of course, a, a, um, a, a sequencer, beat-based sequencer here. And then you can select a zone where you stand, and then you can control that part of the sequencer. So anybody can come with their phone and, and just kind of become part of that sequencer and turn stuff on and off. You can see there's nobody in this part of the loop at this point. Um, so the infrastructure has been expanding um, so that we can you know, send OSC and even um, MIDI-based messages now. So for instance, Ableton Live was used in the previous example. And this is a project that EarCam did with Chloe. Um, where there was an installation of 21 mounted devices and then interaction from public uh, cell phone um, as well. And um, so here you can see the basic kind of server function where all the audio and control is, is happening and then Ableton being used as a time synchronous playback device for the looping. Um, now, in addition to that, of course, I've, I want this piece to have a virtual reality environment so that when you walk into that space, into the concert hall, you'll be in the virtual reality environment with everybody else. Another exciting development there is, um, is, is just evolving now is WebVR. 
and the standards are not set for this yet, but there's a lot of fantastic stuff out there. So aframe.io is the main web VR framework that's out there at the moment. And when you combine that with, that should be 3.js, sorry, 3.js, mm -hmm. um, you end up with actually a really powerful VR environment, again, that can run within the browser. And people are like recreating all kinds of stuff and building quite sophisticated VR environments running in the browser. Um, here, for example, is like a kid who just built Minecraft in a morning in, in web VR and is, is playing it in a headset with controllers. So the Vive, so you can plug all the normal headsets. And so that's just running in the browser. Um, <clears throat> so then what I've been doing is I've been running around Paris um, and we'll be running around um, Karlsruhe with my VR camera, ambisonic microphone, and recording in urban parks. So I'm really thinking about this notion of the experience of the urban nature and how do we inhabit that as a, as a performance work. And obviously both of these cities have a lot of um, urban nature around them. Um, here's a little example, for instance, earlier in February in Paris, there's a lot of snow. Um, and so this is me just actually picking up the camera and walking along with it. Um, and so you can get a, a general sense here of the fact that if you're turning around with the headset on and, and the perspective is, is dynamic to the individual, then everybody can be kind of in these environments in their own way, but equally have a communal impact on the performance of the work. Using the browser, obviously I've just said, hey, the browser's really awesome. So the benefits are obviously, there's no gatekeeper, right? I don't have to get Apple to say, hey, yeah, we like your app, it's okay, we can put it up on the store and people can download it. Um, I don't need anybody to download stuff, because if you imagine, well, I've got a bunch of VR content in there and I ask you to download the app before you come to the concert, it could be a big app, right? And you just might not have that amount of space on your phone. Um, the other advantage is that the current version in the concert is always the live version, right? I'm compiling it at the time of the concert. So whatever development we're doing is live every time we do the piece. It doesn't have to be uploaded and to the App Store and re-downloaded and so on. We can make performances anywhere. There's a network and evolving stuff that we're doing with this. I'm really excited about just doing concerts, just using phones and, and thinking about what happens if we do flash mob concerts and we just like send out a tweet saying, be at this place, we're going to do a concert, right? Because all we need is a hub and a computer and everybody's phones and then off we go. So we could do that anywhere. Um, Nearly everybody has a device, obviously, and, and it, will en it engages you in a direct way in the performance of the concert in a way that is not otherwise normally the case. Now, of course, there are some drawbacks, right? It's early in this technology. Many of the protocols are still being developed. Um, Web VR is just, like, n not a protocol at all yet. Um, phone models differ in specifications, so the amplitude of the sound varies, the quality of the loudspeaker varies. Um, so the audio playback can vary, you know, so that can give us some inconsistency in outcomes. Now, I see all of this improving really rapidly, like the difference between the quality and amplitude of a loudspeaker in a phone a year ago to today is remarkably better already today. Um, so I see all this developing, but at the moment, in this kind of early phase, we still have some of these challenges. There are ways of addressing some of those things, like sending a a pulse from each phone to analyze the frequency content and so on, um, but, you know, it means a huge infrastructure in the background. So thinking about the space as communal, um, <coughs> the fact that we attach the sounds or send the sounds to you engages you directly. There's the possibility in the work when you're wearing the virtual reality headset for sounds to be jumping between people and to track movement and location and, and in the virtual reality space start drawing vectors between people, for instance, who are moving in similar directions at similar speeds and so on. So ways of engaging them. At the moment I'm, I'm working, I'm kind of playing with representing the people in the concert space as like floating clouds. So you'll see where other people are as this representation. So you, if you want to walk around, the idea being that you can walk around during the concert, you won't run into them but they won't look like a person. Um, and then, of course, thinking about how dynamically can we spatialize. I'll demonstrate one version of that today. 
and we're starting to work on the next phase, which will, will allow me to kind of generate groups of, of phones in the space and send different material to those groups and, and so on. So there's lots still to develop. Um, I have to have developed that by December <laughs> in order to do a concert at ZKM. Um, I started this year with these two concerts um, already in the books and was like, I have no idea how to make this piece. Um, so it's going to be an exciting year. <laughs> and um, fortunately, I've had a huge amount of support um, from all of these people, um, including some who are here, Marcus, for instance, um, at EarCam, and that's allowed us to accelerate that development a lot. So now to the fun part. Um, <clears throat> we're going to do a little uh, performance, about 23 minutes of the first part of the work. Um, it, the performance will be for high order ambisonic that we have here um, and your cell phone. So what I'd like you to do is get your phone out, um, preferably first of all put it in aeroplane mode so that uh, you're not going to get texts and other things coming to your phone during the performance. And then go back in and turn on Wi-Fi and join this network that's sitting there, future perfect. It may tell you that there's no internet access on that network. That's fine, because it's a closed network for this performance. Can I ask a question? Sorry, can I just ask a question? Yep. Um, have, you, have, you, have you considered constructing these communal environments um, where the network topology isn't purely centralized? So where you don't, it's not all client server, and right. you have direct connection. You have mm. Um, I haven't at this point, no. Because um, it's around this work that we're kind of developing these ideas, so I'm going to be sending you all content at, at particular points, and then I'm going to be doing vector-based panning across the, all of the phones. Um, so I've got a kind of, that's a kind of central point model at the moment, yeah. I guess it makes a lot of sense to do it this way for concerts and yeah. performances. Yeah. I was just wondering, though, because you mentioned the sort of yeah, and true. Yeah. Non purely central yeah. topologies seem. Yeah, absolutely. Conducive. I mean, the other thing is, of course, that all of the work they've done at EarCam is on interactive stuff, so that you would come with your phone and, in, and interactively do make the work, right? And so I've kind of turned that on, the, on its head a little bit, because I'm like, actually, I just want people to listen, <laughs> right? I don't want them going, oh, what happens? Is it broken yet? What are the boundaries of my interact? You know, all these things that you do when you're given a task that turn it into an active thing, I want you to listen. I want you really deeply to listen. Um, so therefore, I don't want to give you a task to do in that same sense, yeah. Um, but I want to engage you, and I think you'll find when the sound comes to your phone that that's quite engaging. And of course, it generates a completely different kind of spatial audio experience. Um, so, yeah, if you can uh, then open a browser and go to this URL. I set up a new wireless infrastructure for today, so I hope this is going to work. Because <laughs> the old one I had only ran like 50 people, and when I was at EarCam, somebody else set up the wireless. <laughs> so, that was, so hopefully that'll work. And then it'll come up and it'll ask, say, welcome to Future Perfect. Um, so then touch the screen, and then it'll come up with a with an area, and it'll ask you to tell me where you are in that space. So this is front, right, where the screen is. So try and calculate where you are in that space. Touch the screen at that point and click Send. OK, and then what you can see here is what's called the Soloist interface, uh, which is on this iPad that's also logged in. And these are, these are all your phones, the locations that you've just given me um, logged up in here. Um, now, what you can see here, this is my main performance interface. At the top here, I have a slider um, that gives me a decay curve on the sound. So when I play a sound on your phone, there's a decay curve on the ending of that phone. I can control the length of that. Um, and then this second slider controls the size of my touch point, right, which I can now move through the audience to do vector pace panning. So this is doing vector-based panning from the center of that location. Um, and so when it's like right over your phone, it's going to be maximum amplitude. Obviously, I can change that so I can play, really play the sound across the whole audience, or I can make that super small. And now we really have point source locations moving across so the... So we stand out on the line, can we do wave field synthesis? 
Yes, well, I, we did joke about the fact that you could just put your phone in a box with the speaker pointing out and that'd have a, a, a portable wave field rig. Um, anyway, so that's that, that's that part of the interface that I'll be performing um, as we go along today. And then the other part of the interface, okay, so these are the two performance interfaces. Um, so here you can see all your phones. You can see down the bottom all of the possible sounds that I've got there to load. Um, and then um, up here in the top right, um, you can see actually folders or collections of sounds that I can send to your phone. So if I send the click on the first one, it's just sent um, footsteps actually to your phone. Um, and so now um, if your volume, make sure your volume's turned up and you're not muted. Um, if I touch any of the touch pads down here, I can trigger that to play on somebody. Who's that? Okay, so you're number 25. Um, so I can trigger that to play on people's phones. And so I can, can actually send, um, you know, trigger those to play. And then at the top here, I can set up loop numbers, um, you know, the period between the looping, how much jitter there is in that, and, and so on and so forth. Now, the other thing which is not developed really yet, but is really cool, is that if I trigger that to play on your phone, and then I send you another, phone, another sound, I can trigger that to play on your phone at the same time. And I could actually build up layers of polyphony on your phone because each sound gets its own thread. So I have control over each sound independently, even though they're all playing on the same hardware. They're all in a different thread, right? Um, which means that I could trigger stuff to play on your phone and still spatialize other layers that are sitting on your phone at the same time. Um, so I'm not going to try and do all of that today. <laughs> um, we're just going to use this, you know, basic system. All right, let's go.
Hezbollah. <laughs> and the last probably three minutes of that was only phones. How long can you go with the phone? Can Not very. Yeah. So you'll note that most of the sounds are picked to be kind of in the responsive range of the loudspeaker. Yeah. It's very responsive, huh? You yeah. Your move, your, your panning between all of us really quickly. Yeah, so like the... Um, this sound in particular... Yeah. Yeah, so the latency is very... Yeah. But there's a fairly long decay on that. Oh, I've, it's well, at eight it's seconds at the moment. That's intentional. I mean, I can, can you change that. Yeah. Pretty good. <laughs> Have you done any percussive stuff with it? No, this is the only piece... I mean, this is the piece that this caused this to be built. So, um, and... As I say, I've concert for in December, so, sure, sure, sure. and this is maybe only half of the piece. So, um, so no, I, but I see huge potential for a whole variety of things. I mean, the next thing that we're working on now for the next part of the work is, um, hang on, maybe I should just go over there, plug it in so you can see the interface again. Thank you. So obviously, a bunch of you have dropped off there, but the, the, there's still some phones there and. And that's, you can see the, you know. Um, so the next thing that we're working on is being able to draw um, arbitrary groupings of these phones. Um, so a new mode where I'll just be able to draw my finger around groupings of phones. Um, because it's, it's, as you may have noticed, the humans were there at the beginning of the piece and then they kind of disappeared, right? And it's time for them to come back. Um, so... Um, in the arbitrary groupings, I'll be able to send um, vocal and manipulated vocal samples, and so I can build a kind of polyphony across the audience um, of those vocal samples. Um, and then I'll be able to still spatialise those and control those in the, in the other ways that I can do. So that's the next phase, sorry, of, of, yeah. of building these kind of poly polyphony, and I could see yeah, a whole bunch of other possibilities here. If you could, I mean, yeah. Just th I was just thinking, you know, rhythmically, if the, if the, if the drum machine, I mean, if you could touch each one and, and find each one at different, just quickly. Yeah, so, so, so if you look at the Cosmo project, because they've done a bunch of things where everybody's a drum part, oh, and yeah. then you shake your phone, uses no, no, the gyroscope to trigger yeah. it and stuff. Yeah, right. Um, I could, I don't have a rhythmic sample here, but part of the value of having a background clock is that I could play rhythmic samples across your phones and they would stay synchronised um, within a few milliseconds, which is close enough for yeah. most things. Um, so, yeah, that's the value of having the background clock, um, which is, takes a bit of overhead but has all these benefits. And you could probably hear some of those samples when they were synchronous and some I have just slightly different timbral variation in. And you might have heard the variation, but they still stay, they're staying synchronous. This didn't happen to me, but is it possible for someone to sort of fall off the map during performance if something happens to their phone? And if so, is it easy for them to get back on? Yes. Yes, so the answer is, is that you shouldn't fall off because actually I'm sending a single black pixel video to everybody's phones to keep them awake. Um, so in theory, you shouldn't. But some phones do decide just to go to sleep anyway. Um, if you, uh, for example, if you accidentally block your phone... Yeah. There. Right. Well, and actually, I'm keeping an eye on that because um, in the controller interface, right, so I can see all the phones that are there, right, and I can see whether they've got a loaded sound or not because see the red dot, right? Yeah. And so some phones just sometimes don't take the sound for whatever reason. And so I can just go in here and see all my sounds. And I did this several times. Um, where are we? and just send you that sound, like, manually. So I'm kind of keeping an eye on making sure that everybody's loaded, and if they're not, sending them. Um, and then, of course, you know, you can trigger them all from here as well. Um, so that's really great. So somebody's just come back on again, and so I can just send them that 
that sound. Uh, oh, well, everybody's joining now. All right. Um, so that's, so that's a real uh, something that I built into that controller interface is that I could be, I could be constantly looking. Has anybody dropped off, come on, or somebody's just finally got around to joining, or... So the system, again, is dynamic, and it's, it's not kind of like a fixed point, yeah. Yeah. Are we going to be able to use this application? Um, it will be open source um, when we're finished, yes. Yep. Um, the Cosima framework is currently open source. These developments are not yet, because it's still, I mean, it's still very much in development. You can just watch. At the moment? Yes, but probably in a year it'll be, it'll, I don't know what the time frame will be. I hopefully it'll be less than that, but within the next year it should be available as open source on the ear cam. Okay. You, you might have already explained this, and if so, I'm sorry, but so when we select our dot, yep. is now our phone dynamic? Like we were walking around the room, right. when you were you know, drawing on your iPad, right. you'll catch us wherever we are, Correct. or you'll only catch us where our dot is? No, so the dot is just a kind of stand, is, is a is a intermediary stage because in by December I'll have the Navisense um, tracking built in and I'll just know where you are. You won't need to tell me, and then you can dynamically move through the space and I'll just pan over wherever you happen to be. So it, the whole map becomes dynamic. Um, Tebow also built me a extension of Spat that allows me to put all the phones into Spat. So then, with the idea that the ambisonics and the phones all become a single single diffusion space. Um, so then we could automate gestures across the whole thing. So then the idea that we were sitting here today is just a pre-Navisense iteration. That's of this right. Piece, right. Because ordinarily we would be walking around the room experiencing sound from different points. Yes. Or you might choose to sit, but whatever. I mean then the system is completely flexible for whatever you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. So I, I heard a little bit Pop noise, pop okay. sounds from, yeah, from, the, from the phones. Was that your intention to have the pop, uh, pop sound? Is that me or is that you? Yeah, yeah I think it's pretty good. Yeah, you're still over on the OK. No, it's good. Oh, OK, <laughs> it was me. <laughs> <laughs> it was me. Mm -hmm. um, OK, and I realize that it's kind of time for you to have coffee and stuff as well. Sorry, what was that question? I just lost uh, that. Yeah. Pops. There shouldn't be any pops, no. So it's possible that some phones were distorting a little bit, but there shouldn't be any. Um, every sound is sent in its own thread, so it'll always have a decay on the end of it, so it won't just stop suddenly, even if I send new sounds over the top of it. Um, so it, it's possible that there were some weird things in the phone. It's also possible there are some lip clicks and some little other sounds that I'm generating. So it could be that you were just hearing those and thinking they were some other artifact. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the lip clicks may not have come to your phone because in that section I send several different samples across the um, audience. So, yeah. All right, a couple more questions then. I better let you have coffee. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, huge. Uh, um, so I've been working with Ambisonics and VR now for about five years. Um, and we um, w helped, worked with Blue Ripple in England to build a bunch of plugins for Unity that allowed us to do VR, uh, Ambisonics in, in Unity. Um, and so that's, so that's really important in my view, like really important in, in VR is to have fully three-dimensional spatial audio. Um, it gives you all kinds of really powerful cues about place and location and so on. And there's actually one scene that I have on a big grass plane um, uh, up um, uh, outside of Flagstaff. Um, and in the audio, you hear a crow flying across the sky. And lots of people tell me, oh, I see the bird flying across the sky. And I make all the material. And I know the bird's not in the image. And, and this is a whole other discussion. But the images are 
fixed images because otherwise people spend a lot of time looking for animals and doing stuff rather than listening. Um, so I know the bird's not in the sky, but lots of people tell me it is, and even friends who I'm like, no, there is no bird in the sky, they're like, no, I can see the bird in the sky. So the 3D audio cues, even at first order ambisonics, are strong enough to cause, um, to cause sens sensory fusion between those two domains, and that's like super interesting. Um, and you can run third order also on the on the phone VR um, for an hour or so without <laughs> overheating, and that gives you obviously much better. Um, in terms of this work, I'm really trying to explore that. So the idea that everybody in the concert space has their own point of view, and is like wherever they're looking is where they're looking. So if you imagine the world exists separately for everybody and cumulatively for everybody at the same time, that's like a real head trip. <laughs> And I think that opens up a whole bunch of interesting creative potential for interaction and morphing of the work based on people's behaviour within the work, which, of course, brings me back to the whole ecosystem kind of thought again, yeah. All right, so I think we better break and have coffee because I know they have to set up um, for the next session. And um, thank you very much for your attention. It was a pleasure to yeah. share the work with you.